All right. So, so how I got into the business, I mean, I, so I came from this background with my father, I mean, going back to classic, the days of classic Hollywood of the 1930s and 40s. Um, now, one thing I will say, though, that Hollywood of my father, uh, of course, no longer exists. That Hollywood was a totally different world. Dad used to tell me Hollywood Boulevard in the 30s and 40s. It was clean, and there was no litter and no graffiti, and people would get all dressed up and walk the boulevard. And it was, uh, it was glamorous. You'd see stars walking up and down Hollywood Boulevard. My grandfather had a bookstore called Winkler & Son Books. It was like the Barnes & Noble of the day in the 30s. And... and uh, Dad uh, just told me it was an amazing thing. Dad, you know, was in the Hollywood Christmas Parade as a celebrity. Actually, funny story, he was in the car with Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein. And Dad was sitting in the back, and he was all excited during the parade and was kicking by accident uh, Boris Karloff in the back of the head. And, and Karloff turns to my father and says... Listen, Bobby, not too many children get to kick Frankenstein and get away with it. <laughs> and my dad said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Karloff, I won't kick you again. But anyway, that Hollywood was totally a, a totally different, glamorous, clean, uh, wonderful place, okay? Um, I got into the business in the, in the early 1980s. And uh, I had loved sci-fi, fantasy, and adventure television shows, movies as a kid. I especially liked Japanese stuff. I loved the Godzilla movies. I used to watch Ultraman as a kid, the English dub series. Um, I'd come home from school, do my homework, have milk and cookies, and when I was done with all that, I would turn on the TV, and from like 4.30 to 5, it would be Ultraman. And it was like watching a miniature Godzilla movie every day, Monday through Friday. And all the friends at school, all, my, all the guys loved Ultraman, and we'd get into fights on the playground, you know, as if we were the heroes fighting the monsters or whatnot. And, of course, Speed Racer was great, too. I love that. And it stuck with me for some reason. I always thought that the Japanese stuff of that era was very artistic. It, it, I, I appreciated the art. I appreciated the quality of it. And there were certain elements, it's hard to put into words or explain, was very different from anything else that was on TV. And so I became very interested in that. Um, I, I, I went to college. I, I studied acting and directing at UCLA with a man named Don Richardson. Now, he was fantastic. Don Richardson directed... I don't know, 800 primetime television shows in the 50s and 60s. He had come from New York. He directed, you know, plays in New York. He came from that whole New York Academy of Dramatic Arts, and he knew Stella Adler and Lilia Kazan and, and Lee Strasberg and all those people. He thought that they were full of shit, <laughs> you know. Uh, he taught an alternative to method acting. He was very adamant. You don't have to be a... Dr you don't have to do drugs to play a drug dealer or a drug user. You don't have to turn tricks to play a prostitute. It's the work of the imagination. He also thought that they got the Russian thing all wrong, you know. But anyway, Don Richardson was wonderful. He taught an alternative to method acting, and he taught directing, and he was absolutely fantastic. He taught acting to Anne Bancroft, Grace Kelly, Zero Mostel, John Cassavetes, Elizabeth Montgomery... And I learned so much from Don Richardson, and I use it today as a director, you know, actors asking questions. Who am I? What do I want? How do I feel? Acting's 80% emotion. If the behavior's correct, even a deaf audience will understand it. Uh, the Emotion's everything. Uh, I, I could go on and on about that, but the bottom line is I use Don Richardson's principles every time I direct something. You know, and it's funny, you know, going back to the Ultraman influence, that I later became the producer, writer, director of the American English versions of all the new movies. Well, I wanted to wear all the hats. I wanted to be able to write. I wanted to be able to produce. I wanted to be able to direct. And so uh, I got an agent. I got into Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA and such. And... Um, 
I began doing what are considered like silent bit parts or five and under parts in lots of stuff in the 80s. Uh, for example, I would do, in an episode of Remington Steel with Pierce Brosnan and Doris Roberts, um, I would play a car thief. And so on the set it was Pierce Brosnan, Doris Roberts, me, and a couple guys playing the heavies, the villains. And there was a scene where Doris Roberts was investigating some villains. She went out on a ledge of a building to hide from them. And while she was looking down to the sidewalk in her parked car, which was this gorgeous thing, I stole her car. You know, when I'm waving to her, hi, you know. And I would do things like that. Um, Murder, She Wrote. I'd play like a bellhop in Murder, She Wrote. Or, or The Fall Guy. I did some second unit stuff on that. I was the stand-in for Jason Bateman on a sitcom called It's Your Move, which was like one of his first things. And I played his part. So while he was in school... I actually performed the part during the rehearsals and for the NBC people uh, and, and on the set. And then they'd have, they'd throw little five and unders or, you know, silent bits or whatever. So I did that. And uh, I remember Garrett Morris from Saturday Night Live was one of the actors on it. And he says, hey, man, you better than, you better than the star of this thing. Why aren't you starring it? And I said, shut up or I'll lose my job, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway... Um, I did, I was in Back to the Future, and again, it was one of those little kind of silent bit things. Obviously, it got cut out, but I remember being on that set, and the, the, I was one of the 1950s kids in Back to the Future, and I remember that courthouse square set was amazing, because all the storefronts had 1950s uh, products, candy bars, whatever, and it was, the detail, the attention to detail was just incredible. It was really like you were back in the 50s. And I'll never forget, I went into the hair department. I went to makeup. I had all this grease on my hair. I, I mean, I looked like a kid in the 50s. I always looked much younger than my age. And I remember this big Universal Studios t tour bus had to was avoiding Courthouse Square, but was near the makeup trailer. So when I got out, the tour guide said, Oh, and this is the set for our new upcoming film, Back to the Future, and there's one of our stars. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. And 10 million Japanese tourists <laughs> got up and took my picture, and I just, you know, raced out of there. But I'd like to get one of those pictures. I think that would be kind of interesting. I, I, did a, I played a drunk kid in Pretty in Pink. Anyway, I did a whole bunch of that stuff. And then I did, you know, I had an IBM computer commercial that went for many years, and I was the star of that. It was on all the CBS shows. Remember, at that time, there was only like three major networks, okay? So when I was in a commercial, you could theoretically get 80 million people watching that commercial, okay? It, there was no internet. There was no phone stuff. There was no, 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 not a lot of cable. So when you were a star on a commercial or something, it was a big thing. When I did these little bit things in the sitcoms. It was a bit, I'd be recognized. You know, it was crazy. I would go to the bank. Hey, were you the guy on, on Family Ties? Where? Oh, anyway, I, I, you know, if you look up the IMDb, you'll see all that stuff. I mean, I, I, there's, I did a ton of it. Okay. But it was a learning experience too, because I learned the tremendous waste of Hollywood that, you know, uh, anyway, I, I learned that after, it doesn't really make sense to do 25 or 30 takes of any one scene. I don't think it usually gets better. It just wears the actor out, you know. But anyway, so I had a connection with Tatsunoko Production Company, and I began to start to produce my first anime series, which was Tekaman the Space Knight. And that was, um, uh, it was about a space pilot who battled evil alien robots, and he'd wear this indestructible armor. And um, anyway, Tatsunoko wanted to work with me, and uh, I wrote, produced, and directed the American English language version of that show. And we were working with 16 millimeter film prints, and I was actually splicing film, and, and uh, we dubbed it at Bob Clampett's recording studio. And Bob Clampett was a famous artist from Warner Brothers. He, I think he created Tweety Bird and Sylvester and all that. But anyway, his famous characters were Beanie and Cecil. And so we recorded 
the, the episodes of Tekaman in the Beanie and Cecil recording studio that I think they had in the 60s. And it was right there on Seward in, in Hollywood. And uh, I asked my father if he'd do a voice to play the professor, Dr. Edward Richardson. So after a sabbatical, Dad came back and did the voice. He stepped right into it. It was just like back in the 30s. And he did a great job. And I'm so glad I got to work with him on that. And then we had many other great actors and character people and Clancy Serko and Kathy Pruitt. Oh, they're all gone. Now. A lot of them are gone now. Bill Hederly Jr. played Tekaman, and he was very much of a method actor. So when he was in the dubbing booth and Tekaman was battling the evil alien robots, he would be jumping up and down in the booth. Space Lance! Spur Cutters! Take that! You know, um, he was, it was terrific. You know, I mean, he fulfilled that part. It was over-the-top acting, which is what it required. But um, I, you have to understand something. I was the youngest producer of a television show, especially an anime show, at that time. I was 19 years old, and I had a syndicated television series going. And I was before most of the companies that do anime today they came much later. I was, I predate them, okay? And I'm still working today. Um, when we had it syndicated in Chicago, Minneapolis, Atlanta, whatever, it, you know, we had over 10 million kids watching Tekka Man. And, uh, you know, at that time, uh, to, as of the date of this recording, we're doing this interview today. I mean, major networks will get maybe 2 million, 5 million viewers. Uh, Tekka Man got more than tonight's primetime major network television, as far as audience, okay? And, you know, I was a, I was a small company at the time. Uh, they were just, you know, a, a show like The Transformers or, or, or GoBots had an even infinitely bigger audience than what Tekka Man was. So just to let you know what the audiences were like back then. But there were very strict rules for children's television at that time. And there were network standards and practices. There was a lady named Pe uh, Peggy Sharon, and she had, a comp she had a group or an organization called Action for Children's Television. And, oh, she was going after all these shows that were basically half-hour ads for toys, you know. Now, we didn't have a toy line for Tekka Man at, at that time. And um, so she, we were okay. We were off her radar. But there were a lot of things you had to do. With Tekka Man, we had to kind of cut... A little bit of the violence out because the show was too violent in some ways. Um, I try to do as little of it as possible and the alien creatures that were destroyed by Tekka Man, or killed by Tekka Man, we referred to them as androids or robots. So we would never kill an alien, evil alien creature. We would deactivate a robot. <laughs> And that was it. Or if you saw this giant ship explode, we'd have to put a line in there like, well, by some miracle, luckily nobody was seriously hurt. You know, that type of thing. But that's what you had to do. These were kids' shows aired for children. I, I've got the TV guides to this day. You know, every Friday, Tech Man would be running in the San Francisco area from 8.30 to 9 or 8 to 8.30. I can't remember. But... um. Of course, that all changed later.